Happy birthday, now you're one year older. Happy birthday, your life still isn't over. Happy birthday, you did not accomplish much, but you didn't die this year. I guess that's good enough. Good evening, Rowan. It's the 14th of June, 2016, and it's about 10 o'clock. And I'm making you an extra special video this week because you're a birthday boy. Uh, so you'll be really glad that I'm so thoughtful as to make you this video this evening um, before I come and arrest you in Cambridge tomorrow. So I was going to make you a cake as a visual aid for this video since it's your birthday, but actually that only occurred to me a couple of minutes ago. Um, and so I didn't want to delay making the video for a long time so I could bake a cake. Uh, so instead of baking a cake, um, I had already made some gazpacho. I've also made a lasagna, but it was a bit difficult to get that on the video. So I've put some gazpacho in a wine glass to celebrate your birthday. It's kind of in lieu of a cake. Uh, so I hope you appreciate that. Anyway, I thought we could finish off having a chat about your strange lecture about Dostoevsky at the Royal Society of Literature on the 16th of May. And uh, this is actually a clip um, that I was going to play um, and talk about in my last video, but I'd already gone on for quite some time, so I thought, oh, I'll just miss it out. Um, but since I'm making you a special birthday video, I might as well comment on it now. Um, so here's what you say. In the last and the most ample of the novels, Brothers Karamazov, Dostoevsky is more explicit than anywhere else about his faith, and at the same time leaves as many loose ends as he ever does. It sounds a bit like you, really. You like loose ends all over the place and don't move on too soon and... Um, Closure's a bad thing and all that kind of thing. We need to keep everything as confused as possible for as long as possible. So you go on to say, famously, he gives us in this novel what must be the most eloquent statement of the theological problem of evil that's been written in European literature. Uh, well, I can't comment on everything that's been written in European literature. Um, however, I can say that Christian doctrine does adequately explain the problem of evil. And it isn't a problem in the sense that it can't be explained. Because um, what happened was that God created everything perfectly. Um, and Satan was an angel in heaven created like other angels and he rebelled against god he wanted to usurp god's place to take over and be in charge of everything um, and he fell from grace um, and god had created everything perfect including the earth and everything on it um, and satan tempted eve um, to eat from the fruit of the tree of good and evil um, the knowledge of good and evil and knowledge just doesn't mean knowing about something it means knowing it in the sense that it's real for you and you're doing it uh, really that's what knowledge means in the, the Hebrew context which um, the Old Testament was mostly written in um, so this brought sin and death into the world and suffering uh, so Evil isn't really a theological problem because it's quite adequately explained by the Bible and by Christian doctrine. Um, so you don't like answers to questions, do you? You like to be asking as many questions as you can, like should the state be dictating people's beliefs and all that kind of thing. So you don't like closure and explanations. Um, you like to be bewildering everybody with constant discussions about things that have already been solved and very often are completely irrelevant anyway. So you then say, for those who are not familiar with the novel, let me just remind you of how this arises. The novel begins with an attempt at family reconciliation. The Karamazov family is as dysfunctional as families can get. So that's a bit like your family then that um, spawned you. 
The father of the family is boorish, lecherous, drunken, clownish figure. One of those gloriously impossible figures that Dostoevsky loved to depict. Um, well, it's not that gloriously impossible, really, because that sounds quite like a, a description of David Peach, who was an alcoholic but wasn't drinking at the time I knew him, not that I saw anyway, um, and wasn't very clownish either because um, he wasn't very funny at all. So you're describing him as a shamelessly embarrassing man. Well, that's a good description of David Peach as well, and you're quite an embarrassing man as well with all the crap that you come out with. Um, as if you're some expert in absolutely everything that's taken place on earth at any point in history. Um, so you then say, and his gift for embarrassing everyone in sight is immediately on display when he arrives at the monastery for what's meant to be a careful pastoral meeting where he and his sons will try and work out some sort of modus vivendi. And then you go on to talk about the 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 three sons, um, Dimitri, who's a soldier, Ivan, who's an aspiring journalist, an atheist and political radical, and the youngest son is a novice in the monastery. So the spiritual father of the youngest son in the monastery is the figure who is looked at to provide some sort of reconciliation between these figures now you do like to talk about reconciliation a lot you're not really going on about it too much here but uh, you think you should be able to um force your victims to be involved with you that's what forgiveness and reconciliation mean to you that you're in charge of everybody um, and you tell them who they have to associate with and your victims have to associate with you otherwise there's something wrong with them um, because that's a reasonable outcome to you, that um, you don't have to admit you've done anything wrong. You can threaten to kill your victims, lie about them everywhere and try and destroy them um, and try to coerce them into doing what you want, um, yet there's still something wrong with them if they don't want anything to do with you. Um, so you really like to talk about reconciliation but what you really mean is everybody going along with what you want um, and saying that you're wonderful. So you then say, when the elder first enters the room, he astonishes everyone by bowing to the ground before Dimitri. Recognising in Dimitri, he says, that he's going to confront great suffering. Uh, well, Dimitri is that... Um, daft character who took responsibility for a murder he hadn't done that I commented on the other day um, and you then say that this elder says that uh, Dimitri should be venerated and this is because he's going to confront great suffering. I'm not really too sure that anyone should be venerated um, but if someone should be venerated because they're going to confront great suffering then you should really be venerating me shouldn't you Rowan because of all the suffering that you've put me through with your evil abuse uh, so why are you not venerating me then why are you threatening to kill me and calling me a Nazi and telling me I have to have sex with you and uh I should kill myself and all this kind of thing that you're waiting for the shot. <laughs> so why should someone who's going to face great suffering be venerated? If you're not venerating me, then Rowan, um, and you ought to be venerating an awful lot of people considering all the suffering that you've caused. He has a lively and comical exchange with old Karamazov, exposing some of the roots of the old man's clowning and extreme behaviour. And then you go on to say, like Bishop Tikon, you're a bishop, you're identifying yourself uh, with this man and with this monk, this elder. Like Bishop Tikon in Devils, um, you say that this elder has the gift of penetrating what people want to hide he sees in Dimitri a capacity that no one else does. He sees in the old man the fear and confusion that drives his clowning. 
Uh, well, I am always taking the piss out of you and laughing at you. Um, and you do like to pretend that you've got some profound insight into people. Like you had this profound insight that I was a repressed lesbian. <laughs> the fact that I just didn't want sex with you. <laughs> <laughs> it's just completely irrelevant. So the fact that you're a psychopath and you do everything you can to eliminate the competition, uh, which is how all high-functioning psychopaths operate, that's completely irrelevant as well. And you go around pretending you've got this profound insight into people and really you've got no idea. Uh, so you emphasise this word penetrate as well. You like doing that. Um <laughs> This is because you're such a pervert. Uh, so he sees in Demetra. Oh, yes, he, he has the gift of penetrating, penetrating what people want to hide. He sees in Demetra a capacity that no one else does. He sees in the old man the fear and confusion that drives his clowning. Uh, well, I don't want to hide anything, Rowan. I'm not hiding anything. I'm a very open person, in fact. You want me to be hiding every, everything or anything because um, that would serve your purposes and, uh, you know, feed into your delusion that um, you've got some profound insight into people and that you're very perceptive and holy and virtuous. Uh, whereas, as I've said, uh, you're a psychopath and you don't actually have any insight into people at all. Um, you're just shooting in the dark and you're hoping that you're going to hit a target. Um, and this is another example of that. He sees in the old man the fear and confusion that drives his clowning. Uh, well, I haven't got any fear and confusion, Rowan. Um, I'm certainly a lot less confused than you. I haven't got any fear either. I'm not afraid of anything. I'm not afraid of you. Um, and I haven't got any confusion. In fact, I'm very clear about what's going on and what games you're playing. So you're wasting your time shooting in the dark again and hoping that you're going to hit a target. Um, and... I wouldn't really regard myself as clowning, uh, but you do make a complete fool of yourself virtually every time you open your mouth. Uh, so you're quite easy to laugh at, really. You don't really need a gift of comedy to laugh at you uh, because you keep making such a fool of yourself. Um, and you rely on the social etiquette of other people not to point this out to you, like um, because most people have socialised to be very polite and courteous to other people uh, which is a very good thing and I'm very polite and courteous to people um, who are not treating me in an abusive way and it's a good thing to behave this way however um, people's social inhibitions can be exploited by people like you um, you know they don't want to act in a certain way or say certain things in public and in polite company and particularly not against high profile individuals authority figures like yourself people have been socialized not to do that and people like you and david pete exploited that and i learned that from david pete that he was exploiting people's social inhibitions um, to get a lot away with a lot of unacceptable behavior and you do exactly the same thing um, you don't expect anyone to confront you um, well courtesy and social mores are very good things um, but they're not the whole purpose of life and when it comes to confronting and addressing scumbags like you um, then they really need to be put to one side um, so that people like you and David Peake can be exposed um, for the psychopathic slime balls that you are. Um, so anyway, that's all I'm going to comment on this evening. Uh, but uh, I hope you're enjoying your last birthday of freedom and uh, maybe you've even got some gazpacho there or a cake. <laughs> Anyway, I've put together a mini slideshow uh, of a couple of people you share a birthday with. And one of them is your political idol, someone you really look up to and admire, your political hero. And it's not Che Guevara. Uh, so I'll leave it there for now. So enjoy your birthday 
And don't forget, I know where you're going to be in Cambridge tomorrow at 7.30 in the evening. Uh, so be alert. Hasta la próxima. In the last and most ample of the novels, Brothers Karamazov, Dostoevsky is probably more explicit than anywhere else about his faith. And at the same time, leaves as many loose ends as he ever does. Famously, in this novel, he gives us what must be the most eloquent statement of the theological problem of evil that's been written in European literature. For those who are not familiar with the novel, let me just remind you of how this arises. The novel begins with an attempt at a family reconciliation. The Karamazov family is as dysfunctional as families can get. Fyodor Karamazov, the father of the family, is a boorish, lecherous, drunken, clownish figure. One of those gloriously impossible figures that Dostoevsky loved to depict. A shamelessly embarrassing man. And his gift for embarrassing everybody in sight is immediately on display when he arrives at the monastery for what's meant to be a careful pastoral meeting where he and his sons will try and work out some sort of modus vivendi. The three sons are Dmitri, who is a soldier, not particularly sophisticated, and when we first meet him, not particularly interesting. Ivan, who is an aspiring journalist and an atheist and a political radical. The youngest son, Alyosha, is a novice in the monastery. And Alyosha's spiritual father, the elder Zasima, is the figure who is looked to to provide some sort of reconciliation between these figures. When the elder, when Father Zosima first enters the room, he astonishes everyone by bowing to the ground before Dmitri. Recognizing in Dmitri, he says, that he is going to confront great suffering and therefore should be venerated. He has a lively and comical exchange with old Karamazov exposing some of the roots of the old man's clowning and extreme behavior. Like Bishop Tikhon in Devils, Zosima has the gift of penetrating to what people want to hide. He sees in Dmitri a capacity that nobody else does. He sees in the old man the fear and confusion that drives his clowning. Birthday. You wish you had more money. Happy birthday. Your life's so sad, it's funny. Happy birthday. How much more can you take? But your friends are hungry, so just cut the stupid cake.